Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Susan, for having me over. Now, I'll be honest, my presentation wouldn't be as influential as Raghu's. That's a pretty big shoe, and I don't think so I'll be able to fill that ever. But it's from the kind of the other side, basically, what he talked about. It's about the state-owned enterprises. But we are looking at a bigger sample. We are looking at an international 26 country data. And what basically, just to give you a brief background about this paper, how it started, it was a couple of years ago, back in 2010, when I was wrapping up my PhD thesis. And my PhD was on the dividend payout determinants globally outside US. And if you look at this, most of the developed or developing countries outside US, publicly listed firms have been an integral part of the economy. So what we were doing was, or what I was doing was that in pretty much all the regressions or in all the sample studies, whether it was for South America, Europe, Canada, Asia, I was always controlling for the state-owned enterprise or whether the firm was ever owned by the state by using a dummy variable of zero and one. And a cons there was a consistent pattern. Every time we found that this dummy variable was positive and highly significant, irrespective of the sample period, irrespective of the country, irrespective of a whole bunch of different factors, this thing was which, this was one of the factors which was consistent. And it, I just took a fancy of it, and I called up my supervisor, Cal, and I said, hey, this is something kind of an anomaly which is happening consistently. And he said, OK, let's come up with a finance research letter or an economics letter article. A small one, we'll do a couple of tests, and we'll throw it in. And, but long story short, four years down the line, I'm still working on the paper, and hopefully it'll find a pretty decent house or home. So now coming down to this paper, so what are the key research questions? As I said, this proxy or this variable was consistently positive and highly significant. So, so we start with, do firms really pay higher dividends post privatization? Because at that point, what we were looking was, the, we were only looking at the determinants of payout once the firms were listed. So, we decided to specifically focus on the state-owned enterprises and concentrate whether is it really the case globally. Because until now, we were doing a section by section or a region by region study. If that's the case, then what are the factors which enable privatized firms to pay a dividend premium? What are the key factors? What are the, what's the rationale? What are the firm level determinants which are affecting this phenomena? And is the privatized firm payout premium different to the payout of the standardized listed firms? Do they follow a different pattern? What are the theoretical explanation why this is happening? So that's something which we are trying to answer or address in this paper. So just to give you a brief idea what is privatization, but I think this is honestly, this is a standard slide for the US audience. But I, I, wouldn't, I would be surprised if anyone doesn't know what privatization means in this room. So just to give a brief idea, when government sells a part or 100% of its holding in a firm, then that's called, or that's labeled as privatization. It was a big phenomena during Margaret Thatcher government in UK in 80s. Then it quickly picked up around the rest of the Europe, Canada, Australia around that time. Then during Vajpayee's government, there, it was a big thing in India, disinvestment of the publicly listed firms. In China, it has been a phenomena for last 15 to 20 years. South America, and recently, post Berlin Wall incident and breaking down of the Russian Union, this thing was experienced in Eastern Europe too, or in transition economies. So that's pretty much the motivation. Just to give you a brief idea about the literature, so Bill Meginson, he's, let me put it this way, the grandfather or the father or whatever you want to say, he's the guy who has pretty much done anything and everything on privatization. He's actually Pradeep's colleague back in Oklahoma. So what Bill basically started doing was, in 90s, he had a whole stream of papers which basically looked at the performance of these, just specifically the performance of these state-owned enterprises in an international setting in different papers, pre, three years pre and three years post privatization. So what the idea was that, irrespective of the sample, whether it was for 18, sorry, whether it was for the 18 countries or whether it was for publicly, for developed countries or developing countries, irrespective of that, What they found was that post-listing over a three-year period, 
the level of the leverage or the debt went down, the firm started performing, became more profitable, their operating performance went up, and on an average, what is of primary interest for us is that they found that the level of the dividends went up. Whether it was Meginson, MNR Article 94, D'Souza Meginson, and then there is another author, Narjis Bakri. she pretty much found the same results. And then whether it was for, as I said, developed or developing, the results were consistent. Then came 2008 article uh, about the European economy, and there they do find, which was specifically about the dividend payouts in the euro. And there, again, using the dummy variable and a specific study, they found that post-listing, out of a sample of almost 4,100 or 4,150 firms, only with a handful of 83 privatized firms, they ended up paying almost 15 times more, $308 million per firm per year compared to a non-listed firm, right? So that was the idea. Thank you. Now, let's take a step back and just to give you a brief idea about the key corporate payout theories which explain the dividend payout phenomena of the firms globally, then there is classic life cycle theory, which recently came into play about a decade ago by D'Angelo and Stoltz. So what we are trying to answer is, are privatized firms in a phase of their financial, so just to give you an idea, life cycle theory basically says that firms reach a particular stage in their financial life cycle where they start running out of positive NPV projects. So just to mitigate agency costs, they start paying out higher dividends. And for that, they use retained earnings to total equity as a proxy. So the idea is, are privatized firms in the phase of the financial life cycle where they are mature enough after listing, a couple of years after listing, and they should start paying out higher dividends? Next is the agency conflicts. So as Raghu said, whether it's a free cash flow hypothesis or whether it's for the shareholder protection, which goes back to LLSV's 2000, actually I should have written that, Laporta's 2000 article where he coined, uh, where they coined actually the idea of the outcome hypothesis and substitution where the dividends are either an outcome of an improved corporate governance, a phenomenon of the common law countries, or whether the dividend payment is higher in civil law countries, where the managers are trying to substitute poor corporate governance by paying higher dividends. And then there is the traditional signaling theory where dividends contain information and management wants to show that they are doing their job correctly, so they try to signal that using a higher dividend premium. So these are the three key theories which we're trying to explore and address in this paper and try to find which of them adequately explains the payout premium among these firms. Again, this is the same idea that I said, why the firms are paying higher dividends, what factors are influencing them, and are these state-owned enterprises in that phase of the financial life cycle or whether it is agency issues or whether they are trying to signal something or is it an amalgamation of all the three aspects. Okay, so that was something which has already been done. Now what we do ex in this paper. So our data comes from standard databases, data stream, world scope, world bank, privatization transaction. Sample period extends from 1990 to 2011. Actually, in the latest version of the paper, we have updated the sample. We have gone back to 85 and updated it to 2013. Just to give you an idea, we have 409 privatized firms, around 6,200 non-privatized firms, and in total, 82,000. 600 firm years, of which 245 firms were privatized during our sample period. And of these 121 firms are those firms for which we have three-year pre-listing and three-year post-listing data. Though it sounds to be a pretty small sample of 121 firms compared to 409 firms we start with, but you have to remember we are specifically focused in one part of our study, we are specifically focused on a pre-listing data too, right? So we, we cannot go and say that pre payout premium increased until unless we can show that some, this phenomena has, or how it has changed from before being listed. So that's why this 121 firm sample is quite key. And compared to all the benchmark studies that have been done in the past, until recently, it's a pretty decent sample for an international setting. Besides that, uh, as I said, we have 26 countries, pretty much all the West European countries. Brazil, Russia, India, China, Canada, Australia, then the entire list is up there in the appendix. We also study and test our hypothesis across different subsamples. 
So we tested for control and revenue privatization, just to give you a brief idea. Control privatization is one where the government sells more than 50% of the equity, or government owns less than 50% of the equity after listing. Revenue is where they are only selling a small part to generate certain funds to maybe finance other activities. Then there is competitive versus non-competitive sector industries. Non-competitive will be your FIs and utilities, which are treated a little differently. And then emerging versus developed based on the IMF database. We use standard classic proxy variables, which have been used. We use payout, which we expect to be a po have a positive change post-listing. Then size, profitability, liquidity should increase post-listing. But we should, or we expect the ownership to go down, which is quite obvious because initially, if government is the 100% owner, then post-listing, the ownership concentration should do, go down. Level of the risk should increase because now there might be new managers which are, more, which are higher risk seekers and should be interested in investing in positive NPV projects which come in with an added risk. Growth opportunities should increase. Level of debt should go down. Level of transparency should increase because now there's a wider pool of shareholder base. So they want to be updated on the developments of the firm, right? Now government or a handful of managers are not the one who are governing or owning the company. And finally, efficiency in the number of employees should go down. So there should be redundancy or layoffs. And since we are expecting a higher growth or a higher sales and number of employees going down, we expect a higher operating performance or sales to employee ratio. Now, we start with the results here. So what do we find? In terms of univariate analysis, we find an increase in firm level dividend amount and scaled payout profitability. We find an efficiency growth. We find an increase in transparency, size, and income volatility. So pretty much we are, a, we are able to establish that in this setting, the results hold to the conventional studies. We find a decline in firm level ownership concentration. Although we are not able to find any significant change for cash holding, leverage, number of employees, and growth opportunities in terms of market to book. The results are kind of consistent when we split our sample acro across control and revenue, competitive and non-competitive, and emerging and developed. But remember, these are the results for 121 firms for which we have three years pre and post data. Post privatization increase in payout is associated with an, so if we generalize basically, based on these three subsamples, a table by table result is, definite, is explained there in the article. We find an increase, sorry, we find an increase in payout is associated with an increase in profitability, operating efficiency, sales, transparency, and decline in ownership concentration. Now this is the empirical part. What's the theoretical explanation? We have to find that. So we take one theory at a time and try to refute what's exactly happening. So if you look here, what's trying to happen? See, if it was life cycle theory, then technically at a certain point, Dividends should be at this point, and then they should remain at a particular level after listing, right? A couple of years after listing. They shouldn't keep on increasing. So whether you look at normalized dividend, because we deflate all our finite accounting data using 1990 CPI index values, it shouldn't increase. It should be a straight value, right? Or whether it is the scale dividends, specifically against earnings, there is a steep increase three years after listing, or whether it is when the dividends are scaled against net income. So all in all, evidence does not support the life cycle theory to explicate a, or to explain a dividend premium in this setting. Next, when you look at profitability, you're saying that profitability is increasing, right? Sales is increasing, uh, total assets are increasing. So it kind of reputes your signaling theory too, right? The results do not really explain the idea of signaling or they are, the managers are not increasing the dividends or continuously, keep it, continuously increasing the dividends to signal future profitability, right? So what's happening? Next we do a, so next we run our regression analysis or a multivariate analysis using a difference in difference model estimated on 91 firms with interaction term in post privatization three year period to capture changes in effect of firm level trades. What we find is there's an increase in performance, both for the earnings ratio and growth in sales. 
So this kind of supports to our free cash flow hypothesis, specifically to the substitution model, because what we are finding is there's a, sub, there's a steep increase in dividend payout post listing for civil law country firms compared to common law country firms. This goes back to Laporta's 2000 hypothesis of substitution versus outcome theory. So substitution model says that we find that civil law country firms pay out more and payout increases even more once compared to the common law firms post listing. To some extent, we do not find, or basically, I shouldn't be saying to some extent, we are not able to find any evidence with respect to life cycle hypothesis because firms do not run out of positive NPV projects. If that was the case, we shouldn't be expecting a growth in total assets after listing, right? So definitely, there is no negative influence of, uh, Im sorry. I should, sorry, there's a typo. There's, it should say positive, actually. My apologies for that, right? So that's one aspect, and therefore, if we just look at a three year pre and post period, we kind of are able to support or we are able to show that it is substitution based agency cost theory, which explains the payout premium. Now we bring in the idea of now until now, whenever all the previous studies have primarily looked at the state owned enterprises only specifically, what we do in this study is we bring in non state owned enterprises or privately held firms which are listed on the exchange from these countries which were listed between the period of 1990 and 2011, as per this article, and try to co do a one-on-one -on -one comparison on the factors which are affecting these, perf these firms compared to other publicly listed firms. So we find a higher proportion of payout premium, almost 72% higher compared to, all these results are, by the way, statistically significant, which are reported here. So proportionally, 72% uh, firms in our sample state-owned enterprises pay higher div uh, pay dividends in our sample compared to 64 non-state owned. There's a higher average payout, almost four times more for the state owned enterprises, both at the mean and the median level. When you look at the uh, scaled, so div when the dividends are scaled against earnings, though the numbers might sound a little very small to you, small transition of 0.3 to 0.21, or 0.14 and 0.13, they are all are statistically significant at 1% level. So even after scaling, we are finding that there is a relatively higher payout by these state-owned enterprises. In general, compared to non-state-owned enter enterprises, privatized firms are bigger with relatively higher profitability, diluted ownership, uh, higher ownership concentration even after listing, higher sales growth, comparatively higher debt level, compared to the non-state-owned enterprises. So even after listing, the level of debt on their uh, books do not go down. Now, I'm not saying compared to what it was pre-listing. Now, we are saying compared to the non-state-owned uh, non enterprises, their transparency level increases substantially, and employee count and their co employee count still remains at a higher level, both at the mean and the median level compared to non-state enterprises. Non-privatized firms, on the other hand, exhibit a higher retained earnings and income volatility compared to, non uh, compared to state owned enterprises. So to just to summarize what's happening, even after listing, it's not that the state owned enterprises converges towards uh, non-state owned enterprises dramatically. It's a slow transition process which takes time. So Though they changed in the first half of the presentation, I was trying to show that there are changes compared to post and pre, or in the post session compared to what was the scenario earlier. But even after listing, this is the results after listing, even after listing, they, they still hold most of the characteristics which, were, which they had in nutshell or what they are notoriously known for, let me put it this way, basically, right? So still they are substantially different to, even after listing, okay, in brief, even after listing, they are substantially different to uh, non-state enterprises or privately held firms which are listed, or publicly held firms which are listed on the exchange. When it comes to multivariate analysis, what we find is 
privatized forms pay significantly more both with and without control variables. So when we just include it as a dummy variable or when we include whole bunch of form level control accounting variables as the control factors, uh, the relation is pretty much the same when we include the interaction, just to study the theoretical explanation. There's a positive relation with size, both in terms of market value and employee count, profitability, cash holding, income volatility, operating efficiency, and shareholder protection. Negative relation with er retained earnings, ownership, leverage, the standard stuff, basically. For the difference in difference test, privatization dummy is not significant. Once we include or once we interact, uh, sorry, what, once we interact our privatization dummy with the firm level characteristics, so we lose the significance on the privatization dummy, and that's what we are we were hoping for, because until you are not interacting the variables, okay, we are finding privatization dummy to be significant which says that these firms are paying higher dividends. But once you start interacting in a bigger setting, then you are hoping or you're trying to find that what is the variable or what is the factor, or what is the theory which is explaining this premium? Because then you hope that the dummy loses its significance. And that's where the real answer comes down, or that's where we get the real answer. We find a positive relation with profitability, operating efficiency, sales growth, and reduction in ownership a higher reporting frequency, and employee count. So these are the factors which are basically explaining the premium of these state-owned enterprises in our study. We run a whole bunch of robustness check. If, you, if any one of you has ever followed a payout literature, dividends are always kind of considered as not an efficient way of distributing cash. So there's a whole idea about dividend tax because Different countries can have different tax rules, and now they have gone substantially down, but even in China, they can be as high as 50%, or in US, they, have, they used to be, I think, around 20, 25%. Even in India, they were taxed until a couple of years ago. So we do, long story short, we account for the dividend tax aspect. We use different forms of dividend tax proxies, which have been used in popular corporate finance literature like dividend tax preference from Laporta's article, dividend tax penalty from 84, and average corporate tax, average dividend tax, weighted average between capital gains, whole bunch of different tax variables. And we still find that our results hold. We do a subsample analysis only on revenue, control, competitive, non-competitive, developed emerging, results still hold ground. Next, what we recently added in our paper is that we got a kind of a criticism that, hey, you are taking these 409 firms in your analysis, and you are throwing them against 6,100 firms. So maybe the case is you are only handpicking up these big privatized firms and comparing them with a bigger pool of non-privatized firms, and that's why you are getting the this significant privatization dummy variable. So what we did was we did a propensity score matching and a one-on-one -on -one firm matching criteria using Pharma French factors and we identified those non-state-owned enterprises which had exactly the same characteristic as the state-owned enterprises on the firm level, firm accounting level, in terms of size, profitability, growth opportunities, all in all using the conventional finance data, finance literature. And we find that all these across, and we re go back and do all the analysis which we did, basically, both univariate and multivariate, and we find that our results still hold ground. So basically, no matter what sample you select, we still end up finding a positive influence or positive dividend premium by these state-owned enterprises. Abhinav, one minute. Last slide. So just to conclude, so what we are finding, privatization leads, in general, we all know that privatization leads to harsher product market competition, higher capital market scrutiny, and changes in firms, objective functions, resulting in increase in agency conflicts and uncertainty regarding the firm's future. Definitely, there is a new investor pool who's interested, uh, and they want to look out for their holding interest, so that's pretty much the case. Compared to non-state-owned enterprises, privatized firms are not only more profitable, but also pay proportionately higher profits as dividends. That's what we are finding, else dividend-to-earnings ratio wouldn't increase over time. 
relatively higher payout among civil law country state-owned enterprises firms render marginal support to La Porta substitution hypothesis, right? So that's the first part. So, and the second part is basically a brief summary of whatever results I talked about. So just to take a step back and what we are trying to establish here is that dividends are paid substantially higher by the other state-owned enterprises pay substantially higher dividends. But this phenomena is universal across common law and civil law countries where these higher dividends stem from improved growth opportunities, operating performance, higher profitability, signaling or basically showing that dividends are being used to mitigate agency cost. Now when we split our sample in terms of shareholder protection, we find that the, these higher dividends are coming from civil law countries, though common law countries are also paying substantially higher dividends. But when it comes from civil law countries, then what we find is, or what we can say is that managers, or new managers in these countries of the state-owned enterprises are paying higher dividends to mitigate or to show or substitute the lower corporate governance rules or lower shareholder protection. So we, in one word, we can say that we find results in support of substitution agency cost-based theory. Very good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm, I have to discuss the paper, Rents the Privatized Firm Dividend Premium. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity because it was really very interesting and learning experience reading this paper. Uh, I just, <coughs> so since uh, the author has actually uh, talked uh, quite about the literature, maybe I skip it and just, so the paper provides an insight and further uh, you know, evidence to the entire dividend puzzle literature that is there in the corporate finance studies. Uh, the literature su has suggested alternative theories uh, explaining this, which uh, the mm, paper presenter has actually discussed quite a bit. And they show which, so they basically test for all these theories and show which one works uh, with specific reference to privatized firms in this case as a comparison to uh, non-privatized firms. This is a cross-country study uh, which, which includes develop, developing from all continents possible and it includes a set of 26 countries across a period of 21 years. And they are trying to compare the payout policy for privatized firms before, uh, like three years before when they were privatized to three years after, and also with non-privatized firms. Now, the main results of the paper, so they show that uh, after privatization, the dividend payout by these privatized firms increases, and it also is higher as compared to mm, firms which were non-privatized for all their lives. The important determinants, I, and I think uh, the version of the paper that was presented today is slightly you know, updated from what I got. So the, from the version that I got, the main determinants were performance measures and insider ownership going down, which is basically the agency cost mitigation story that uh, was discussed. And other than that, factors like level of development of the economy, the legal framework of the country were considered to be important factors. Uh, now I think there's an addition to those control variables. Uh, now coming to, again, uh, another thing, for instance, in the paper, the results that showed they have compared now competitive and non-competitive firms. The version I got, it had only competitive firms in the story. So when, uh, uh, which is, I assume, post-privatization, they become competitive. Now, pre, I was, uh, you know, curious, or rather, you know, my discussion would be a list of wish list, what, which I would like to see in the study. Many of them, perhaps, are material for subsequent studies or, you know, other papers. So uh, one is, uh, you know, the, what is missing in the paper is the, like stories underneath. And that is pretty obvious when you have perhaps a cross country study when you know everything is at the aggregate level and you know some of the stories are missing. So for instance, a discussion on you know why a government enterprise like monopoly when it when after privatization it is supposed to maybe perhaps give more dividend other than the agency cost theory also because coming out from the market structure 
literature. That is something I was trying to look out for. So for instance, in India, when Coal India or you know an ONGC, if they go for an IPO, there will be uh, a lot of demand for that, and there's uh, some hidden value which, which gets reflected when it gets listed in the market. Second, after privatization, you know, what, uh, again, there was only discussion on competitive firms, but now it's competitive, non-competitive. If possible, I would, uh, it would be interesting to see furthermore characterization. One example could be, say, affiliation to whether, you know, the firms are getting affiliated to groups. So one of their own papers is about Japanese, uh, you know, privatized firms where, uh, say, business group affiliation has a role to play. So will that have, you know, the who is the owner? Is the it is it getting uh, owned by some business group after privatization? Then coming to uh, while the paper takes care of the technical aspect of you know uh, including industry and year fix FX, what we don't see any discussion on that. So one there is one in the abstract. There's a discussion that the industry FX don't play any role, but uh, uh, you know, uh, one thing is that, say, when a matching of the firms is done, uh, as mentioned in the difference in the different study, and somehow it hides in the um, appendix, I would wish that it, it is, you know, brought into the foreground, because many of the interesting results are in the appendix than what we see as the main results in the text. So b b perhaps it could be because it's work in progress. So for instance, for matching of firms, the, uh, the criteria that are they taken are from the pharma uh, measures of financial uh, uh, characteristics. Why not an industry matching of say, privatized versus non-privatized firms. And a discussion on the, because I would believe that, you know, sectoral factors ha would have an effect on dividend distribution. Uh, there, do we see some sort of difference between privatized and non-privatized uh, across different countries? Then, while the year fixed effects take care of, you know, what is happening across uh, the time-specific effects, but uh, this 1990 to 2011 period is fairly long period when there are a lot of reforms that would have happened across different countries. Say, uh, the sample also includes India, for instance, and in India, 2004-5, you know, uh, reforms had taken place. So, will does this any of these you know reforms coincide with the period of privatization that we see? Say. Will that have an effect, or in general, the reform period is going to have an impact on the payout policies in general? Would something uh, that a discussion on that would be really enlightening? <coughs> now, uh, there is this appendix. So, in the paper, in the first instance, it is uh, told that. The paper does not include utilities and financial firms. However, some of the very interesting results uh, come out, or some of the important variables actually turn out to be significant only after inclusion of regulated industries, which comes into uh, uh, the paper in the form of Appendix 5A and 5B. So I was wondering, because there's sort of literature which says that the characteristics of regulated industries would be different from the rest of it. So if we, if the paper finally ends up including regulated industries, why not, you know, have some specific controls for it vis-a-vis -vis other firms to see, you know, whether they are, how they are driving the result or, you know, is there some other explanation for it that is uh, bringing in the story? And I feel that, um, you know, many of these studies actually don't take regulated industries, but with state-owned enterprises, these regulated industries have really a lot of interesting story to tell. So if this is included, maybe that would add more value. Uh, some comments regarding the methodology, uh, like one I have already mentioned in terms of matching, and that again, you know, is in an appendix in the version which I saw. I would really see if that is the main result, and perhaps what is in the main text can go in the appendix as a robustness check. Uh, that would perhaps help in terms of uh, uh, like publication requirements also. Uh, in now, there are a lot of this uh, privatization-related uh, interaction terms floating. Uh, 
which which obviously has you know implications for multicollinearity i would really like to see a correlation table at least you know to mm -hmm. address that and if there is multicollinearity uh, how it is going to be addressed there is a possible endogeneity problem one can see because there's a lot of literature which says that privatization does affect earnings. So we are saying privatization leading to earnings and then we are talking about the dividend story. Uh, all the paper actually mentions and they are taking a lag but I'm not very sure how much of this gets addressed. So this was more about uh, this thing. One question which I didn't want to put it in the slide was regarding the revenue privatizations where more than 50% of the ownership still lies with the government. So there again, which me, and I, the paper shows that these revenue privatizations are higher, giving out more dividend than the control privatizations. So which means a large part of this money is actually going to the government. So you know, will that have an implication and, and a discussion thereof would uh, really be nice. Okay, thank you very much. Any uh, evidence about common law versus civil law countries? Why such a behavior about difference in the dividend distribution happens? See, generally, if you look at the legal structure of, and uh, the literature has been quite vocal about it, that shareholders on an average face a higher protection or uh, have a better standing in common law countries compa compared to civil law countries. So we take common law as a dummy variable in a, and control for the shareholder protection. And, and so the idea is that's what I was trying to talk about the outcome and the substitution hypothesis that if the shareholders are in a better governed country and in that country if they are getting higher dividends, let's say for example in US, right? If they are getting higher dividends in US, then it is an outcome of improved governance. While let's say take the case of continental Europe, like France or Germany, where it's a civil law structure, if the shareholders are getting higher dividend there, where the legal structure is comparatively weaker than a common law country, then the idea is that the managers are trying to substitute weaker governance through a higher dividend payment because they are trying to establish a reputation for themselves. So in future, when they revisit the market to raise capital, whether in the bond market or equity market, they can raise it at a lower cost. So in this paper, actually, we just look at three years pre and post. But we do control for the time trend variable. So besides using the year fixed effect, we have time trend variable. And throughout all the models, and even for the interaction, this time trend model, time trend variable is positive and significant. So over time, even after, because when it, besides the three year pre and post in that too, we have a time trend. But that's quite obvious from the graph. But when we are running the test for the state-owned enterprise, it, the full sample, at that point, we find a positive variable, positive effect, significantly positive effect for both the year and year multiplied by SOE or privatization dummy. So we can argue that privatization doesn't, the premium doesn't stop three years after listing, it continues throughout the sample. Yeah, actually, thanks, really good suggestions, but I think you miss it interpreted the idea of competitive industry. Com it's not the firms are becoming competitive after listing. Okay. It, it's competitive and non-competitive. Literature, basically, privatization literature says that state-owned uh, the firms in the utility sector and FIs, or regulated sector, as you said, are non-competitive firms, and the others are, all the other industrial firms are competitive firms. So that's what I was trying to talk about. Secondly, you said about the matching, industry matching, basically. That's a little bit tricky because there can be certain countries, if you look at the, this literature, where, let's say China, for example. How can you match, uh, how can you do an industry matching in China because then the thing is that pretty much all the utilities might be just owned by the state. Or in Russia, all the utilities might be owned by the state. Because if you try to do matching in that setting, you wouldn't be able to find any non-privatized firms. 
So what we do is we limit the matching to that particular country, basically, if not the industry. So that's how we try to address this. Correlation table is a very good idea. Uh, I guess that's pretty much it, yeah. Oh, just one, can I, yeah. Uh, since the civil law countries yeah. comes out to be more significant, I was just mm. wondering that can we have a more, uh, like a, a you know, more uh, stronger measure other than the dummy for this minority shareholding rights? I, I think I got the cue from the other paper actually. So right yeah. now you are mm -hmm. having dummy, right? Isn't it? Yeah. What we can do is there is this, I think, Genco's bondholder rights and shareholder rights variable. Mm -hmm. We can include that. Uh, that's a static variable for each country. And I think we can include that basically. And then that will be, that will vary country by country rather than varying for, yeah, um, that's, that's, that's that can be a, yeah. 